Welcome warmly, all of you. I will be the host of today's discussion, Zoon Ahmed Khan, fellow at CCG. And now, without further ado, let me warmly welcome the speech, the introductory remarks by William McCower, Editorial Director for Business Economics and Political Science and Law at Springer Nature. A brief introduction is that he's based in Singapore. He leads a team of publishing editors based across the Asia Pacific region, covering the fields of business, economics, political science, and law. William McCower has been residing in Singapore for over eight years. He has worked with Springer Nature for more than 17 years. And it was also in October last year that he first visited to Beijing to conduct some job interviews. He also subsequently visited Tokyo, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Singapore, and New Delhi frequently over the course of 2012 and 2013. William McCower has cooperated with CCG for this book. And now let's hear from him the context and uh, the backdrop and also the need for this book uh, in today's time. So welcome, William McCower, for your opening remarks. Thank you, Zun. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me OK? Yes. OK. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Bill Ockauer, Editorial Director at Springer Nature. I'm joining today from Singapore, where I'm based. I'm delighted to take part in the launch of another terrific volume we at Springer Nature have the privilege to publish together with the Center for China and Globalization. Mm -hmm. I'm responsible for two of our key Springer Nature publishing imprints in Asia for political science and international relations books. Those publishing imprints are called Palgrave Macmillan and Springer, both under the umbrella of our parent organization, Springer Nature. Since 2021, we've been publishing in collaboration with CCG, a remarkable open access book series entitled China and Globalization under the Springer imprint. The book series is edited by Henry Wong and Mabel Lu Miao. Today, we are thrilled to launch a Palgrave Macmillan open access volume entitled Understanding Globalization, Global Gaps, and Power Shifts in the 21st Century, CCG Global Dialogues. This new book, features many of the same themes covered in volumes published in China and globalization, including books such as Consensus or Conflict, China and Globalization in the 21st Century, an edited work that features contributions from several of the same authors who took part in the dialogues of this new Palgrave Macmillan book. I'm really happy that Henry and Mabel decided to work with my colleague, Mr. Jacob Dreyer, senior editor, Palgrave Macmillan to publish this exciting new volume under the Palgrave Macmillan imprint. The dialogues that, that feature in the chapters of this book make for truly engaging reading. The introductory chapter composed by Henry and Mabel provides a clear structure of the book's themes and presents those individuals taking parts in the dialogues and their concepts around globalization. What makes the dialogue so interesting is that the themes of globalization often have common ground across the various dialogue partners with whom Henry engages in each chapter. By starting out at the very beginning of the introduction with two images of the earth from space, both the blue marble and pale blue dot, Henry and Mabel set the scene for how we on planet earth are such a small pixel in the vast universe yet we have been battling against each other for so long within that same small pixel. Paraphrasing Carl Sagan, Henry and Mabel reflect and state, and think of the wars that generals and emperors have waged throughout history, all for momentary control of a fraction of that pale blue dot. I personally think these images of the earth and space sort of make the case for globalization as a necessity, especially now. Kishore Mabubani, makes a very moving analogy to explain why it isn't going to work without globalization. He says that in the past, there were 193 countries on the planet and each country had its own independent boat. However, now it's more like there are 193 countries that have their own cabin on the same boat. Since we're so fused, to borrow Tom Friedman's term, in this global village, due to climate change, pandemics, the digital economy, nuclear pr proliferation, and more, 
we have to work together to prevent our own single global ship from sinking. In Henry's dialogue with Joseph Nye, readers learn about the concept of the horizontal power shift from west to east and the vertical power shift from governments to transnational and non-governmental actors. The first being associated with power over a little bit as I see it like Kishore Mababani's 193 separate boats analogy and the second power with a little bit as I see it like Kishore Mababani's 193 cabins on the same boat analogy. We have to deal with both constructs, co both constructs of power over and power with at the same time, as Henry and Mabel make reference in their introductory chapter to F. Scott, Fitzger F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Crack Up, in which Fitzgerald famously writes that the test of a first class mind is the ability to hold two contradictory ideas ideas in one's head at the same time and still function. I'm really happy that we could publish this volume of dialogues between Henry and so many great minds from around the world. When reading these the dialogues, I was frequently reminded of President Biden's and President Xi's recent in-person in summit in Bali, Indonesia, during which they both proclaimed that China and the U.S. must develop and build a productive relationship. And I think they both managed mention something along the lines during that summit that the world expects China and the U.S. to cooperate, especially if power with is to work and the single ship of 193 cabins on it isn't going to sink. I think this is true. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. This is clearly going to be another fantastic book. Thank you. Thank you so much, William McCower. And uh, really thank you for, um, you know, also mentioning some of the key concepts that uh, the book has highlighted. These dialogues include perspectives which are obviously helping others who find themselves having less hope in the future of the world realize that there is true potential and there really are significant thinkers, significant scholars, academics, including Dr. Wang, including those who have been part of the dialogue series, who are not only willing but also able to make a difference. So thank you so much. Now let me Pleasure. warmly thank you. Well let me warmly welcome Dr. Mabel Miao, who is Secretary General of the Center for China and Globalization. She is also the co founder of the Center for China and Globalization, the co-author of this book. And I will also briefly mention that it is true that over the years, under the leadership of Dr. Miao, CCG has indeed gained wide international recognition and grown into a significant think tank with global impact that promotes China's globalization process. Dr. Miao also serves as founder and secretary general of the Global Young Leaders Dialogue Program, deputy director general of the Alliance of Global Talent Organizations, AGTO, Secretary General of China Global Talent Society, Secretary General of Policy Advisory Committee of Western Return Scholars Association, and Deputy Director General of the International Writing Center of Beijing Normal University. Today, Dr. Miao will give us opening remarks, insight into this book, and uh, help us understand the context and the, significant, the significance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a kind introduction from Zhu. And uh, good to see all of our old friends, distinguished guests, ladies, gentlemen, good morning and good uh, afternoon. Um, thank you very much for attending the book launch event of CCG. This book is a collection of discussions from the CCG Global Dialogue Series that took place between March and October 2021, the first volume of a China and the World series. Our motivation for launching the CCG Global Dialogue Series draws on the spirit and the core value of CCG. We believe that the globalized world is a core component for the creation of a peaceful and a sustainable world order that contributes to the mutual benefit of all mankind. As part of our mission to serve as a bridge between China and the rest of the world, each year, CCG hosts a range of speakers from around the world at uh, our headquarters here in Beijing. We also have worked to build various bespoken channels and platforms to enhance dialogue between the scholars, 
business leaders, policymakers, and the young people from China and uh, abroad. This includes an annual program of seminars, workshops, and uh, flagship events, such as the China and the Globalization Forum and the Inbound and Outbound Forum. Representatives of the think tanks also participate in international events to exchange their views with people around the world. Uh, tomorrow, actually, we have the uh, Global Think Tanks Innovation Summit in Beijing of CCG's headquarters here. Um, when the world was turned upside down by COVID-19, international meetings and the diplomatic summits were canceled in quick succession as borders closed and the cross-border travel ground to a halt. Many of the usual channels of uh, interaction between people from different countries closed down. As the pandemic spread and the geopolitical tensions rose, there was a greater need than ever for a calm, rational discussion to share views, make sense of the momentous exchange that were occurring, and uh, find ways to work together. In this context, we launched the CCG Global Dialogue Series in a virtual format. We were eager to converse with experts from different countries and disciplines that could help us to put current events in context and explore situation to our shared challenges. The series continued to develop, attracting audience of hundreds of thousands of viewers in China and abroad. The list of participants grew to include prominent journalists and authors, Nobel laureates, former officials with extensive experience at the highest level of government and multilateral institutions, and world-renewed scholars in fields such as international relations, economics, and trade. We have found the perspectives that participants have shared with us to be invaluable in helping to understand the, the trends reshaping our world. The discussions have also generated many ideas as to how we might work together to forge a post-pandemic world that is peaceful, prosperous, and more inclusive. So we decided to share these talks in the form of a book so that readers could absorb the insights shared by our speakers, compare and contrast their perspectives, and enhance their understanding of important issues such as uh, the globalization, global governance, and the multilateralism, the global economy, and our shared transnational threats, and the US-China relation, of course. At a time when the international politics has become more contentious and polarized than ever. We hope this collection will help readers develop a balanced understanding of some of these crucial themes all of times. We are exceptionally grateful to all of the discussants that participated in the CCG Global Dialogue series and along for their comments to be republished in this collection. Without uh, their inspiration, insights, and uh, generosity, this publication would have never been, impossible, been possible. In particular, we would like to extend our warmest thanks to many well-known speakers and writers. Later, I, I think Henry will um, mention that, all of them. I would like to take this opportunity, of course, to express my sense of thanks to Springer Nature, particularly uh, Mr. William Archer, Editorial Director for Business, Economics, and Political Science and Law at Springer Nature, and Jacob Joyer, Senior Editor, Springer Nature. Thank you, all of you. Your encouragement and support was invaluable to the publication of this book. I would also express my sincere thanks to the guests and the experts present. Look forward to hear your insights during our seminar later. Of course, finally, I would like to express my deep uh, 
thanks to our team. Without your assistance and help, we couldn't have this fantastic book. Thank you very much, especially for our colleague Shirley and uh, Yan Jie and the other um, our great colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mabel Miao. Um, indeed, I mean, you know, inspired from the title of this book, I'll also add that if we are to understand globalization, how the concept has been evolving historically, and if we are to address global gaps and to really embrace the power shifts in the 21st century, um, we need to set aside uh, our differences and have open dialogue. Differences in opinions and perspectives must not dissuade us, but in fact must encourage us to uh, push the dialogue, push the conversation to a higher level, to a more effective level. And that's where definitely Center for China and Globalization has stepped up, has engaged scholars like Dr. Mabel Miao mentioned, and their thoughts are going to help influence positively other think tankers, other people and uh, other scholars indeed. So with that, uh, thank you to Dr. Mabel Miao. Now we will officially launch our book, Understanding Globalization, Global Gaps and Power Shifts in the 21st Century. And for that, let me warmly welcome Dr. Henry Hoyao Wang, who is author of the book, president of the Center for China and Globalization, founder of the Center for China and Globalization as well. And let me also briefly mention that CCG is a leading Chinese non-government think tank accredited with the UN special consultative status and ranked 64th among think tanks worldwide in 2020 Global Go-To Think Tank Index by the University of Pennsylvania. Also, Dr. Wang is the former counselor to the State Council of China appointed by the Chinese Premier. In addition, he serves as Vice Chairman of China's Association for International Economic Cooperation under the Ministry of Commerce, Vice Chairman of China Talent Research Society under the Ministry of Human Resources and uh, Social Security, a director of Chinese People's Institute of Foreign Affairs and China National Committee for Pacific Economic Cooperation, both organizations which are under the supervision of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Vice Chairman of China Public Relations Association. He is also Professor and Dean of the Institute of Development of Southwestern University of Finance and Economics, as well as a member of uh, advisory Committee for Global Competence Development at Tsinghua University. And with that, and without further ado, let's warmly welcome Dr. Wang. Yeah, Please. thank you. Uh, thank you, Zoom. And uh, it's it a bit too long <laughs> introduction there. Uh, so uh, uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning, and it depends where you are. And also, uh, 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 and thank uh, uh, William Hatcher and also, of course, uh, uh, the distinguished uh, uh, panelists that uh, we're having uh, today. Uh, for this uh, uh, global launch of understanding globalization, global gaps, and power shift in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is the, uh, we have to really, most of all, thank all the uh, participating, uh, uh, you know, global opinion leaders, and, uh, you know, that my dialogue counterpart really had uh, contributed significantly to this book that we've been able to edit and and uh, and co-edit with with Dr. Mel. So so, uh, I would like to uh, introduce this book uh, formally. I mean, I, we heard a great introduction uh, from uh, uh, from William and of course from Mabel. But I, I'd like also to go further uh, on this book as well. I had little uh, uh, PPT. I would like to uh, share that. And uh, so this is basically uh, you know today uh, uh, is uh, we are we are approaching the end of the year. But let's really. Uh, uh, China is also starting to turn around of this uh, uh, COVID, <laughs> zero COVID, uh, 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 you know, uh, strategy now. And then really, I mean, we are having all those fascinating uh, dialogues uh, during this uh, pandemic time. It's such a, a great uh, uh, occasion to, to, to really look back on that. Uh, so this book is really, I, I want to thank uh, our publisher, Speak Nature again for uh, and also uh, uh, Power Grief, you know, uh, Jacob particularly uh, for his, uh, you know, uh, uh, insights and of course the vision to publish this book. And uh, so understanding uh, globalization, global gaps and, and power shift in the 21st century is this is, this is really a book of a, a collection of the dialogues uh, from a, a, a discussion of the CG dialogue that took place uh, last year, you know, about six months time from March to October uh, which uh, I think is also the uh, 
uh, uh, the first volume of China on the World uh, series on, on the dialogue. And basically, it, it, this book aims to help the readers to make sense of the changing world by, by sharing the views of the global thought leaders on some of the most important issues of our time. And, and of course, they, they're relating to the US-China relations, global governance, climate change, and COVID pandemic particularly. So, so the theme of this dialogue is really neat. It, uh, is the need of the, uh, the to set aside our differences and adopt the more uh, global dialogues that we have to really engage. Uh, so this actually is the global dialogue series. We see that is uh, uh, globalization is is an irresistible force. Uh, you know, also an irresistible trend. Uh, even though they ha it, it can have setbacks, can ha have a deglobalization, uh, but we believe that uh, it has been shaped by many factors, forces and uh, from every corner of the world. So, so we believe globalization will actually uh, uh, continue the core uh, component of this, uh, this creation of a peaceful and sustainable world order uh, that really contribute to the, uh, you know, the benefit of the mankind. So basically given the high stake of, 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 of we're having now and the stability, uh, continued growth and the future of our planet, it is more important that uh, China has to, you know, gain this uh, deeper understanding uh, for the rest of the world, and, uh, and and then of course this is part of the mission of the CCG, as we hear, is trying to bridge China and the rest of the world, and then that's why this is the purpose we launched this book, uh, uh, you know, in, in this Stack Global Dialogue series, and uh, and that of course we we have a really a, a great, very impressive, highly respectful and highly influential least of a participant in the, in the dialogues, including prominent journalists, authors, Nobel laureates, uh, statesmen, former statesmen, and uh, think tankers, and, and many of renowned scholars and in the international relations, economics, and trade, and, and the globalization. So, so this is really uh, very important that we have those uh, great dialogue. And also the series has attracted an audience of hundreds of thousands of viewers in China and, and around the world. And so, so I think this book is great. And this is the first volume of our uh, CCG Global Dialogues. We have actually conducted many dialogues and we hope we'll continue the book uh, uh, once this first book comes out, mm -hmm. and which is really great. Uh, for example, for the last two years, you know, we, we have engaged with many uh, global opinion leaders. You know, uh, I mean, the list is, is, is long, but the, we have some of them in our first book. Uh, but we will we'll, we'll continue to do uh, with rest of the of the of this you know uh, people with dialogue uh, as well. You know there was a, a very impressive list and uh, uh, very very much uh, uh, that actually uh, you know their influence, their thinking, and their uh, thought has has a great influence uh, in the world. And uh, that's why we want to bring them uh, their ideas and their suggestion and recommendation out. Uh, to share with the all you know audience readers around the world, and also our book is open access uh, that uh, we can uh, you know we can easily be downloaded to 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 serve the needs uh, with many many uh, readers, and uh, you know those uh, global leaders' voice you know including of course Larry Summers, uh, and Hank Posen, and uh, and uh, and also I'm actually going to have another dialogue with Richard Hass. Uh, tonight, <laughs> so so we'll have all those uh, great uh, thinkers and, and, and leaders uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the contest to really uh, you know show that the global opinion leaders dialogue is with, with, with Chinese think tank is is very important and timely and and highly relevant. So actually, the, for the content of this book, basically uh, you know we divided this book into three parts uh, with ten dialogues that we have actually. Uh, uh, manage to to to, to add it and and select uh, in all and uh, those but those uh, dialogue are wide range discussions offer unique insights and perspectives on key trends shaping our world in the twenty first century. Basically, those includes the rise of the China and the shift in geopolitics, as well as the evolving nature of a globalization transformation, transnational threats, and of course multilateralism. So you see, the part one is about the ev evolution of the globalization. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an interesting dialogue I had with Yale professor Valerie Hansen. We talk about the globalization start about uh, uh, you know uh, one thousand you know 
uh, 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 years ago, you know, basically that was really very, very interesting dialogue we had. And also we had a dialogue with Martin Wolf, uh, chief editor of the Financial Time. And also we had a dialogue with uh, Thomas Friedman, uh, uh, a famous colonist with New York Times. So those are really uh, concentrated heavily on the evolution of globalization and how that can impact our world. And part two of this book is really how to bridge the gaps and deficit, understanding inequality in a globalized world. And, and I had a dialogue with uh, Nobel laureates and, uh, and uh, you know, Angus Deaton and his wife, Anna Case, and of course, uh, our senior fellow, uh, David Blair as well. David was uh, dean of uh, uh, Eisenhower <laughs> College uh, in the economic department and had many also great thoughts as well. And then, of course, the, the, the very impressive was the dialogue I had with uh, Pascal Ami, the former WTO uh, uh, Director General and now the president of uh, Paris Peace Forum, and Wendy Cutler, the former chief negotiator of the TPP for the US. Very interesting, you know, their idea of how a trade and, and uh, uh, you know, economic investment should be done. And of course, I had another dialogue with, uh, with Carrie Brown, who is the uh, who's uh, in the King's College in London and uh, a very known uh, China hand and expert. We'll hear from him uh, later of this uh, program. Third part actually of this book is really the power shift and great power relations. And we know that, uh, you know, uh, with the power shift in the 21st century, the global south, uh, you know, all the, the rise of China and of course the, uh, the all the BRICS country, ASEAN and, uh, and many other countries, are really uh, changing the dynamic uh, uh, somehow uh, in a global re uh, arena. And of course, I had a dialogue with Joseph Nye and uh, and also uh, and uh, and also dialogue with Graham Allison and and Professor Lee Chen there also. So it's very very interesting to see how their view of these great power relations. And uh, and also I had another dialogue with Adam Posen. He's the president of the Peterson Institute and the Stabro. Stephen Roy, the former U.S. ambassador to China, and John Fountain, uh, the honorary chair of uh, a Brookings Institution, and of course, Zhu Guangyao, the former finance minister, uh, China's G20 Shepa, you know, uh, uh, very prominent uh, in China. So all the, you know, they are thinking are, are really uh, very interesting to, 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 to understand how they say the world, how they see China and the U.S. should work together. And of course, uh, last but not least, I had a very impressive dialogue with Kishu Mahbani, uh, where Willie has cited his uh, famous uh, saying of 193, uh, you know, uh, country is not a 193 boats floating by the 193 cabin uh, in the big junk, uh, gigantic uh, ocean uh, uh, boat. So that's basically uh, the content. We, we had many interesting uh, dialogue points. I mean, uh, just to quickly highlight a few, you know, we had a, a dialogue point with uh, an interesting talk about uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Thomas Friedman, he's saying the world is getting more tight, more, you know, fused and more uh, deep uh, rather than also just flat, uh, very interesting. And uh, we had a, a dialogue with uh, Vanny Hassan. She said that the globalization started about a thousand years ago. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 you know, that's really interesting. Uh, 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 we, which we really, I think, we have to think deep. And China is actually the core of the center over a thousand years ago in the Song Dynasty. Uh, very interesting point. And of course, we, we uh, I talked with uh, Martin Wolf, and he, he is strong against decouple. He said we can't decouple. We, we mustn't decouple, and we have to have a deep, <laughs> good economic relation. This deep, good, like, good economic relation is a good thing. So, so he's really a, a very respected opinion leader, and he says we can't decouple. And unfortunately, we're seeing some of the decouple going on, and so it's important re, re, to reflect his thinking as well. And of course, Ang Steeton, uh, uh, Nobel laureate, uh, he has uh, also saying that we have to really, uh, you know, work together, and 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 people we have to be, you know, cautious about the polarization. Uh, how we can really make uh, enlarge the, the globalization pie that uh, that we can benefit everybody, and, and of course uh, Wendy Cutler, the former chief negotiator of the TPP, and uh, you know, she she actually thinking that the trade is really going to help, and uh, she wants to see uh, you know China and and US work together in in trade point as well, and, and same as Pascal Ami, uh, a, a strong uh, uh, you know supporter of globalization and of uh, go. Of, of the uh, WTO and and trade with with China as well. So 
very, very impressive uh, message for them. Of course, uh, Carrie Brown uh, has also mentioned uh, uh, many, many uh, good points that we're going to hear directly from him uh, later of this program. And of course, uh, Joseph Nye is really impressive. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he, as he says, you know, he said, China does not pose an external external threat to the United States, and the United States does not pose an external threat to China. Absolutely, you know, that's really a great uh, point he's making. I, I really think he, he's uh, such a wise man, and uh, he spoke out, and uh, this is very important. I mean, uh, we're going to see uh, more uh, dialogue with him uh, uh, probably late of the year. And, uh, and of course, uh, Graham Allison, same uh, professor from Harvard Kennedy School, where I, I spent some time there with them. Uh, you know, basically, uh, he has uh, said, objective uh, to condition of 21st century has condemned, uh, condemned the US and China to coexist, since the only option is to co <laughs> destruct. So we have to peacefully live together. That's the only option, basically, he's saying. So, uh, you know, Steve Roy, uh, you know, said the thing, the former U.S. ambassador to China, he has many uh, uh, very uh, wise uh, advice in, in this book as well. And John Thornton, a great friend and honorary chair of the bookings, uh, you know, he, 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 he's really, uh, you know, the ties between America and the Chinese people are absolutely essential to getting a relationship where it needs to be. You know, that, that's really a strong message, I think, from such a, a very knowledgeable uh, think tank uh, uh, in the world. And of course, uh, uh, Mr. Zhu Guangyao, uh, uh, he's also a CCG advisor, the former vice minister of uh, finance of China, China's G20 Sherpa. And uh, he basically also uh, said the uh, same thing, you know, that uh, if effective dialogue, communication, and we really need that. And uh, so, so I think what I want to conclude with the dialogue, dialogue points with uh, uh, Kishu Mahobani basically is saying, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the tragedy about China is that quite often the on global challenges contribute a lot, but it's very good at marketing its uh, uh, contributions. So, so the, 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 the world doesn't really know what China is doing. So I think, you know, basically saying, you know, we have, we have to have a more understanding of, of each other uh, rather than just, just on the surface. So basically, you know, this book is a, is, a, is, a, is a new book addition to the dialogue series, to the China globalization series uh, that we had with uh, Spring Nature, which we already published uh, five books on that. And it's uh, most of them are really uh, open access as well. And the downloads are is, uh, well beyond, uh, you know, two to three millions already uh, worldwide. So we hope that this book series can help better understanding. And it's also a contribution from CCG. Uh, of, of all the world leaders, ambassadors, uh, multinational CEOs, chamber presidents, and of course, global think tank president, and all of them, you know, like our dialogue, you know, most of authors are like people we talk about in this dialogue. So this is what I want to uh, share and uh, uh, talk about, and this is really uh, great uh, to really have such a great panelist today we have, and I really appreciate your, your, your coming, and we hope to hear from you. Uh, now on this book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. Uh, really, I mean, uh, understanding uh, core contents, you know, of the of the dialogues which have inspired uh, this book and which will continue to inspire CCG's work in building uh, bridges of understanding and also help those who um, who seem to believe that polarization or decoupling are inevitabilities. Help them understand from the diverse range of perspectives that there are better paths forward and CCG's, Dr. Wang's and Dr. Mabel's and the entire team's proactive efforts to create that platform and space to help have those dialogues, those conversations and charter, mark those uh, potential, identify those potential solutions uh, towards a world where cooperation is, uh, is more likely. Uh, is something truly commendable. So I recommend all of you. I mean, we, we are going to kickstart the panel discussion with experts uh, from across the world as well. 
uh, but also do download the book and do read in depth these dialogues to gain a deeper understanding and raise your questions, contribute to the conversation. So now, without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, our first panelist. He has shared his message, uh, the significance of the book. He is Lawrence Brahm, founding director of the Himalayan Consensus Institute. Lawrence Brahm is a global activist, international lawyer, political economist, author, and chief economist of the New Earth Institute. He is the architect of two fresh economic paradigms, the Himalayan consensus and the African consensus. And lastly, he has also served as an interlocutor and mediator, providing second track dialogue on complex international and cross-cultural issues. So now let's hear his meaningful, impactful message. I'd like to extend my congratulations to Henry Wang Hui Yao and Mabel Niao Lu and the whole team at CCT for the completion and launch of the new book, Understanding Globalization, Global Gaps, and Power Shifts in the 21st Century. And we are really in a time of enormous power shifts and how that's affecting globalization is affecting every single one of our lives. And this book is actually bringing together all of the voices and insights that we need to have to be able to understand the direction that our future is going to take us in. You know, globalization was something about global integration, integration of systems, of supply chains, um, about best pricing, about connectivity, technology. It was about bringing the world together until something hit called COVID that has changed everything. We've witnessed over the past three years a breakdown of globalization as we knew it. But now we have to be able to rechart our future. We have to ask ourselves a question, are we gonna rebuild the planet the way it was or are we gonna take it into even further directions? Are we gonna be able to even extend ideas and technologies in ways that can benefit people, not just for profitability, but for healthcare, for ecology and for better lifestyles. And from this point of view, I think their work in driving the CCG organization over these years has contributed greatly to China's own outreach to the rest of the world and bringing together the kind of synergies that we really need to be able to navigate the future. This is a time of transition and it couldn't be a better time for a book like this. This kind of book helps us to understand where we've come from and where we're gonna go. And I really wanna express my appreciation to the whole team at CCG for making this happen. Because this is a time when a lot of people just have given up on things and suddenly we see the world reopening, retransforming, and with it, there's innumerable opportunities for everybody. You know, in Chinese, there's a word crisis, you know, wei ji, it always consists of two characters. One is wei xian danger, the other is ji hui opportunity. And we have to be able to see in every crisis situation, there is danger and there is opportunity. We could say because of the COVID crisis, globalization is finished, systems are broken down, it'll never be the same. But actually nothing ever is the same. We're always in a state of transition and a state of change and change and accepting change and actually being with change is what is a very, very deep part of Chinese culture. So in every crisis, you've got your danger, but you've also got your opportunity. And now is an opportunity for everyone to rebuild together a new kind of globalization. One that is a shared common destiny of all of us together. You know, if we don't navigate the future as one, working together, working in synergy and working in harmony, there ain't gonna be a future for anybody. And that is the magic of this opportunity that's arisen before us now at this time. So once again, I really wanna express my full thanks to Henry, Mabel, the whole CCG team, uh, what you've done at this time to put out this book. Is it a time of need? And it is an opportunity to help others realize their potential and the potential that we have as a planet working together if we can all work 
in the direction of synergy and cooperation. You know, globalization is a very funny term. People have had a lot of misunderstandings about it. I remember in the 1990s when we started to really talk about globalization, we saw the integration of supply systems, we saw foreign investment coming into China, we saw Chinese investment going to Europe, the United States, we saw a world getting closer and closer, people were coming together in a way that they hadn't ever before. And now we've had this crisis of COVID, you know, we've had this crisis that has set back globalization. By what? By three years? So we ha can't give up on this. We have to understand that global integration, global communication, and bringing people together, whether it's in the areas of culture or science or technology or finance, this is a human trend that is not going to stop. I mean, it goes back to the Silk Road. It goes back to Zheng He and his own you know, naval expeditions. It goes back way even further. You know, it goes back to the very beginnings of human evolution. We need to work together as people. So despite the conflicts that arise, there's also enormous collaborations that have always existed. The very nature of culture is something that arises from interaction. It's scientific, you know, photons are inert until they're kinetic. You have to have interaction to have new things arise. And consequently, we've had a period of global stagnation. And it's time for all of us together to come out of that stagnation. And this book that Henry Wong and Mabel Liu have put forward is actually a guidebook in many ways of how we're going to do this together. It is, in a way, a navigational blueprint of how we in this planet, how nation to nation, how collaborative group have to work together to be able to restart global economies and to realize the importance. Great. Wow. Thank you so much. That was Lawrence Pram. And really with this um, very deep, important message of the very significance of the work that Center for China and Globalization is doing, the work that Dr. Wang and Dr. Mabel Miao, along with the team, are doing, and the importance of this book, because he also, I mean, he talks about change as the only constant and how we embrace it, how we accept the changes and make the best of them, how we recognize the potential of our shared existence as humanity, and how we choose to also interpret history. Because historically, you look at the ancient Silk Road, and today, when you look at the concept of a shared future for humanity, which is uh, which is a very important value we need to uh, embrace moving forward, um, illogically, it makes sense for us to combine our, uh, accept the differences we have, think of unity rather than uniformity, and really uh, see this crisis, as he mentioned in the Chinese language, it's obviously a challenge, but also there is opportunity. And we see that opportunity uh, in, ahead of us. Um, it's all about perspective. So thank you so much. Now, this is also a perfect note to invite our panelist, David Blair, Vice President of the Center for China and Globalization. David, I will briefly introduce you. Uh, you are an economist and a writer specializing in banking and finance, macroeconomics, technological innovation, and healthcare. You were the senior business columnist for China Daily in Beijing, and uh, where you have written over 250 articles, uh, many of them on the front page. Um, you also have an academic background. You have experience uh, helping governments and businesses in India, Italy, etc., really improve. So you have a global experience. You have a global perspective. You are an economist. You, you understand the various dimensions that, uh, that are part of the global trends we are trying to better interpret. So from your perspective, your experience, um, what are the contents of this book that stand out? And uh, what is the most important message? Well, thank you. I, I think the series of dialogue that this, base, that this book is based upon and the continuing series of dialogues that continues to today and will continue in the future are very important venues for Chinese and Westerners, mostly a lot of Americans, to have in-depth conversations about 
their fundamental thinking about the world. Unfortunately, the relations are so bad between the countries now that there are not very many venues like this that are created. When, when Henry first started this series, I was a little afraid that he wouldn't be able to do it because I thought many American experts might be a little afraid uh, to participate with a Chinese think tank. And the fact that he is, has been able to accomplish this is, is, is really a, a great accomplishment because there are, as I said, there, there's no other place where senior Americans and senior Chinese can have this kind of conversation with each other. Open, thoughtful, sort of open-ended. Uh, I, I think this is really a, an important thing to be going on right now at the time when um, relations are sort of the worst I've seen since the reform and opening up started in China. Um, another thing that this dialogue accomplishes is that I, I think it's very good that it forces American scholars and American thinkers and former politicians to think about how to explain their position to China. In, in, in the U.S., this is not only Americans, but Westerners in general, uh, there's a lot of what we call preaching to the choir. Basically, you're talking to a group of people who already think the same way you do and agree with what you say. And it's, it's, I was struck in these dialogues with the fact that people had to explain their position to China. And I thought that's very useful as an exercise for senior thinkers to have to go through that process and say, and I'm talking to people that already think the same way I do and are likely to clap no matter what I say, I have to explain my deepest positions to China and, and the rest of the world. So I think this is a, it's a phenomenally important uh, set of a book and especially the dialogues are, are, are very important. Uh, there are a lot of issues raised in the book that I that come up in the dialogues that I think are the critical international relations issues that are going to continue in the future. And we need it's very helpful to think about how to deal with them. Uh, for example, there was a, a lot of discussion about the nature of power shifts that are going on. The the power shift from from Western you know, European slash American power to more globalized and more Asian power. This is a big change in the world. And it's happened almost suddenly. I mean, I'd say within the last 20 years, it's really become apparent. It's important that we're talking about this and that we think about how to manage it, how to make it where it makes everybody better off rather than just, okay, England defeated France. France is least less well, well off, and now England's better off. We we need a a situation where it's not zero sum, it's positive sum, and it, it could be what I really fear is it could be very negative sum. Uh, war is not you know zero sum is a lot better than war, which is very negative sum. So I think having these discussions can help people understand well if if they're willing to listen. There's a big danger of people not being willing to listen to these discussions. I, I see a lot of, you know, for, for most American politicians, the default position is to attack China because it's costless to them. Uh, it, it doesn't really require a lot of thought, and it, it makes them sound kind of tough. Uh, but at least these dialogues are here, so people who are seriously interested and seriously open-minded can think about how to manage this relationship and how to make, make it better so it's better for everybody. There are other power shifts. There's a lot of talk in, in some of the dialogues about the power shift from government to transnational institutions or government to, um, to private sector institutions in some case. Uh, I, I think those are very interesting and very useful dialogues to think about not only how the world is going externally, but how it's going internally within countries. Uh, I'm, I'm quite skeptical that states are losing power, especially after what we've seen in the last three years. I think 
states have shown that they, when they want to, they can have a lot more power than any of the transnational or private sector actors. But that's that's a, a point that we should discuss further. Um, I thought the discussion that, that Henry had with uh, Graham Allison and with others on the Thucydides trap and whether this was a, a necessary situation where that would almost automatically lead to war. That's also very useful, especially because now we're in a world where, as, as was pointed out, where the United States and China really don't have any existential threats against each other. I mean, I, I, I keep telling colleagues and former colleagues in the United States, U.S. and China really don't have much to fight about. <laughs> you know, there, there's not really very much point of contention, and you have to go looking for it. And unfortunately, some people are looking for it. Um, you know, I, I, heaven forbid that I would disagree with uh, Graham Allison on the meaning of, of Thucydides. But it, as, if I remember reading it a long time ago, the message that I took from it was that the war started largely because of honor and pride and insults, that uh, essentially the Spartans were insulted by the Athenians. The Athenians went around insulting just about everybody. And that was a large motivation for the war. And I think in addition to Gray Madison's lesson about the Thucydides trap, that's a really important lesson too. Because I mean, for example, uh, Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan was pointless, accomplished, uh, who knows why she did it, but it was almost a calculated provocation, calculated insult. And people need to understand how dangerous that can be. You know, sort of people that live on, you know, there's a term among young people in the United States called dissing. And they will kill each other if they get disrespected on the street. Uh, that's that's something that international leaders need to understand. They need to avoid this kind of disrespectful behavior, which can lead to untold bad consequences. Uh, there's also a lot of discussion about where globalization is going. What it, what it means for trade in the future, uh, what it means for sort of the growth of neoliberal institutions. I especially enjoyed the discussion with uh, Angus Deaton and Ann Case uh, about inequality. I, I think it's important that we take to heart the fact that most everybody here, most everybody on this call is at a fairly high level of income. And there's a lot of inequality that has grown, and a lot of it will be blamed on globalization, I think unfairly. I mean, in, in the United States, for example, uh, median real wages have not gone up at all, zero growth since 1979. That's median real wages. There's been a big transfer of wealth from labor to capital owners and to rentiers. Um, and I think that was caused largely by domestic policies, changes in the banking laws, uh, changes in refusal to enforce antitrust law, um, uh, low interest rates, all of that goes to contribute to growth of the wealth of already wealthy people. But it's much easier to blame China and to blame globalization. This book the discussion helps us avoid that. Um, and I also enjoy discussions throughout about how to use history to analyze the present. I, I thought those were really interesting. I'd really like to hear a lot more about that. I, I would like to have once, I, I'm encouraging some Chinese scholar to write a readable 500 page book that gives me a good interpretation of Chinese history, not a list of the, of the uh, dynasties but something where I can put it in context in the same way after spending a lifetime of reading Western history, I can understand what was, what the issues were in the West. So, um, and anyway, just to sum up, I, I think this book contributes a lot to our discussions in the future. I, I think it, it's a, a starting point for people who want to understand 
the real issues that the world is facing and for having an open discussion. You know, we're not gonna agree with each other necessarily, but have an open discussion so we can at least understand each other. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David Blair, uh, Vice President of CCG. There are so many points and I feel like some of them are also interesting to take up with Dr. Wang. For instance, the idea that having conversation, candid dialogue with those we disagree with or those we may have a very different vantage point from is very important. And like you mentioned, you were not very confident in the beginning, will this be a success or not? Uh, but it seems it obviously indeed it has been a success. So maybe some tips, some ideas, some points that encouraged uh, these dialogues to continue, encouraged uh, scholars from other parts of the world, especially the US to continue engaging. And why is it that they felt also the need to help China understand their perspective? So this was obviously, uh, this is a major achievement of the book. And I believe there must be a lot of Chinese scholars listening now and thinking about that 500 page book you recommend. Hopefully we will see that soon in the pipeline as well. So thank you so much, David. I think a lot of your points uh, that, that you mentioned and highlighted give us a good uh, context to now move forward to our next panelist, Harvey Zodin, who is uh, the senior consultant of the National Image Communication Research Center of Tsinghua University, and also senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. Uh, Dr. Uh, Zodin has obviously major achievements, many achievements, accomplishments, including that he was appointed by the 39th US President Jimmy Carter as his lawyer on a presidential committee. Um, and also you have published over 300 columns focusing on international affairs, Sino-US relations, the BRI, art and culture. Um, a sought after speaker and also uh, last, uh, lastly, very importantly, you have been named uh, by the American Biography Institute as one of the great thinkers of the 21st century. So uh, Dr. Zodin, uh, taking forward from uh, the points that Dr. Blair has highlighted, uh, what is the need for us? I mean, given the context and the content of this book, given um, the fact that people are at times and often wrongly blaming globalization, um, there is a tendency to promote uh, ideas that agree with us rather than addressing the ones that disagree and to help bring forward better consensus. So uh, what do you think, how can this book achieve uh, a, a positive result, achieve more impact, and what are the core ideas that need to be pushed forward? Uh, thanks, Zoon. Thank you very much. Um, I really read this book with interest. And uh, I concentrated on the section that had to do with bilateral relations. I have to say that the CCG Global Dialogue Series, it's really been a godsend for millions around the world who've been confined at various times since 2021. So when you talk about globalization, uh, this was a virtual globalization on steroids that built e-bridges, continued online connectivity when their physical connectivity was severely severely constrained. Mm -hmm. CCG, you know, you provided a lifeline to many of us thirsting for intellectual stimulation. We were used to during normal times, but uh, it was denied us the last couple of years. And what CCG pulled off during those dark days and providing so much light puts the term awesome mm -hmm. on a completely different plane. Um, so now a year plus on from uh, when those dialogues took place, we can reflect on the opinions of these masters of the universe when it comes to the subjects to which they've devoted their lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, about the great power relations, uh, be, uh, especially those uh, between uh, China and uh, the US, uh, I think it's really important to, to focus our minds on this. And I think that the book helps us do this. Um, it really is a guidebook. Uh, it is uh, a guidebook to uh, international relations. It's a guidebook uh, to great power relations. So I don't think anybody can say how Sino-US relations are going to develop from here on. But because none of us have a crystal ball to peer into the future. But what's certain from reading the book and from what we know is that if we, China, the US, Europe, and other nations don't get our act together well, mm -hmm 
we're all toast. We're doomed. Albert mm. Einstein was the founder of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist in 1945. Two years later, they launched the now famous Doomsday Book that measures the amount of time till Armageddon, till the destruction of our universe. And for the last three years, the clock's been struck at 100 seconds to midnight, the closest it's ever been. But I predict that in a few weeks when their experts reset the clock, it's going to be at 60 seconds or less, given the state of our bilateral relations, President Putin's military operation, his frequent bellicose statements about using nuclear weapons, the failure, as I see it, of COP27 and a host of other conflicts. And uh, I especially uh, like the part in the book uh, where Professor Nye takes issue with his colleague, uh, Graham Allison's Thucydides trap analysis. Um, I buy Allison's analysis. I don't agree with Joe Nye that an established power threatened by a rising power since ancient Greek times more often than not uh, gone to war. Uh, it, it's the case. The great wars of the past, even the two world wars of the last century, are going to pale in comparison to what could come next. In the final chapter of the book, um, I was also interested that uh, Kishore Mabubani talked about the distinct possibility of two trains headed uh, for a horrendous crash. It's chilling that he found a recent trip to the U.S. that most Americans see China as the evil empire. It's a bipartisan uh, view tinged through the historical lens of American racism, in this case of uh, yellow peril. So what I got from the book is that we need to cooperate where our national interests overlap. And the, some of those things are climate change, public health, conflict management, arms control. We have to keep talking. I think that the recent biden Xi summit at the G20 was a good start. The, the recent visit to China by uh, Grittenbrink and Rosenberger was a positive development to plan for a visit by Secretary of State Blinken early next year. But it worries me that on the same trip, they visited Japan and South Korea, in part to shore up American efforts to encircle China and to contain its rise, which has been a concern of China since basically time immemorial for millennia. Um, we also need to be looking at the creaky institutions that make up the rules-based international order from the UN on down. They're showing their age. They need to be reoriented uh, to our 21st century world and beyond. The inability of the UN to stop Putin's war or the folly of the WTO uh, decision-making are just two cases in point. We also need to resume regular bilateral dialogues. It may be too much to hope for, but the bilateral Sino-U.S. strategic and economic dialogues, essentially killed by Donald Trump, would be a godsend right now. But it's wishful thinking that they'll come back anytime soon. Yet uh, the events of the last couple you know, weeks, uh, I think, are quite positive uh, when you compare it to the recent past. So I think anybody who's interested in international relations, anybody who's interested in seeing our planet be able to continue beyond the 21st century has to read this guidebook because uh, it's thought provoking and it really lays out a lot of interesting thinking um, about how we can get through what's essentially a maze that if we don't get through um, we're not going to have a future. So thank you, CCG, for pulling off the impossible and in very difficult times with these uh, books and especially this one in the series. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zodin. Really, I think especially the last part where you mentioned people, um, this, this book, this compilation, these dialogues can help us think of a different way forward, of a more positive way forward. And, um, and definitely it gives us important frameworks, you know, to think about um, also, I would say national interest, redefining national interests in ways that are less uh, divisive. So you mentioned that uh, apart from core areas where the national interests are overlapping, there will need to be more dialogue, reflection. But even the 
consciousness, I mean, the idea of what is our national interest? What is each individual country's national interest? Are we neglecting global challenges that do affect us, maybe in the medium and long term? And that's where I'm also very happy to have Jacob Dreher, Jacob Dreher on the panel. He is senior editor, Springer Nature. And uh, Jacob, uh, you uh, your focus is business, economics, politics, and law publishing unit. And you're based in Shanghai. You commission books from Greater China, Japan, Korea, Russia, and more. And we also recently um, had you on a panel. You're part of the GYLD uh, Global Young Leaders Dialogue. And in, in as a panelist, you talked about you know global governance, uh, climate change, how you as a publisher can think about through your work, um, you know, encouraging um, the ideas that can unite people by focusing on you know climate change global issues so first of all um you as a publisher your thoughts on the book just like uh dr blair and dr zodin mentioned and also maybe perhaps um what further i mean how can these such books such compilations such efforts help especially a younger generation conceive a world where we have more uh, positive sum mentality thank you thank you so much well um I uh, am very, very glad to be involved in publishing this book. Um, of course, I'm sort of a bystander to Dr. Wong's incredible institute. I think one of the things that I've always thought uh, so unique about the CCG is it kind of combines all the academic rigor and thoughts of like that we're familiar with academic think tanks. But also it strikes me that Dr. Wong is an intensely practical person. He is, um, you know, they say the perfect is the enemy of the Good. And Dr. Wong is one of the very few people who was going to Europe, going to Singapore, going to the U.S., even knowing that he will have to quarantine when he was getting back. During these years of closed borders, Dr. Wong didn't let any of that stop him. And so um, I'm as a publisher, it's great to publish a book like this. And you mentioned how this could inspire young people. I think one obvious thing uh, what's given this book series such staying power is that by being open access, Young people all over the world and those who don't necessarily go to Harvard or go to Peking University, they can access it. So when we look at the more than one million downloads of one of the books in the series, I, I have to imagine that many of those are happening across the global south with a new generation of intellectuals, a new generation of students and scholars from Pakistan to Ethiopia to Indonesia to Brazil to the U.S. to China, who don't conceive of the world as a set of little states that have to, you know, the red team versus the blue team, but really see our, our destiny as common, which I think is really the only logical way to understand it. Of course, I speak uh, not only as a publisher, but also as an American who has lived in China since 2008. And um, I've got to admit that in these uh, past few years, it's been a little bit of a rocky ride. Uh, not so much because of anything that's actually happened, but because the discourse uh, that I see in the media, I'm reading the English language media all the time, just seems very um, unhinged to me. Uh, and I also have to wonder, am I the one that's crazy or is the New York Times the one that's crazy? I'm not really completely sure all the time. Um, and I, I have to say that Dr. Wong's activities have given me great confidence, not only on a, just an academic level, but frankly on a personal level because his activities make me know, yeah, I'm not crazy. China is still the same old China. It didn't all of a sudden turn into like uh, the set for like uh, Darth Vader's uh, Death Star. It's pretty much the similar place that it used to be when I came here in 2008. And um, it's, it's evolved. It's developed in many ways that are tangible. For example, um, when I lived in Beijing in 2015, the air was very polluted. It isn't anymore. We can also see, you know, we've this, this time that Dr. Wong has been writing and publishing all these books being a lone voice in the wilderness to advocate for dialogue and cooperation. Well, it looks like uh, China's borders may well open soon. Um, in fact, probably even by the time that we publish our next open access book. Uh, I, I, the discussion of uh, Dr. Graham Allison's work in this book made me happy because we're, we're discussing publishing a whole book of Dr. Allison in cooperation with CCG next year. So, um, I, I love the idea of dialogue. Uh, of course, it harks back to Plato's Platonic dialogues, where he has these imaginary dialogues with Socrates, trying to find out the nature of things. Um, it seems to me, uh, when we talk about the U.S.-China relationship, again, just thinking of, I'm an American, 
<laughs> I live in China. So relating to China is a question that's important to me just on a personal level every single day, uh, especially um, uh, as, as you know, in the last years, my, my relationship to China has changed. Most notably, um, I, I guess, uh, in, in contrary to all the doom wishers and the war predictors, um, my, we've started a family this year and my son was born uh, one month ago in Shanghai and we've oh. already applied for his American passport. So I got to say that I'm voting with my feet and I'm voting with my family's life on a positive future for U.S.-China relations. I tend to think that we see a lot of um, very short-term uh, negative mentalities that are fueled by things like Twitter uh, and are not necessarily tied to the realities which we see. One, one big source of that is that many Americans have not actually been to come, able to come to China for the past few years, which is unfortunate and necessary reflection of the coronavirus controls. But I, I'm very confident that very soon we'll start to see mass academic exchanges, um, people from finance companies coming to China and finding out what they can invest in. And we'll all sort of remember uh, all the positive things about globalization. And we'll know that that didn't just go away overnight just because, you know, some um, Eldridge Colby, son of the CIA, director of the Vietnam War era, says so. Uh, so anyway, I, I think I'm rambling, but I, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Wong for this, not only as an editor of books, but also as um, a human being who lives in China, has lived in China, and intends to continue doing so. Uh, I often find myself puzzled by so much about this country, but I think that would be true no matter what country in the world I've lived in. And I find that for me personally, dialogues with other intellectuals and figures, like the one that we had the other uh, month, uh, Zoom, about the floods in Pakistan. Those are the ways that I learn the best because if I just talk to myself in the mirror all the time, I find that it only makes me more resentful and more frightened and more out of touch with reality. And it's only in talking to friends that um, I can sort of get a grip and think of some constructive things to do. So I, I have to applaud Dr. Wong for not only his academic rigor, but also his personal courage. And, you know, they say when everyone zigs, you zag. And Dr. Wong certainly he has zagged. He has gone against the stream when everyone has, you know, sort of convinced themselves we have to have an argument. He has been the one voice of reason that says, no, globalization benefited us all and it will continue to do so. And I think I think very, very soon we'll see, in fact, that, that was borne out. So um, that's that's most of what I have to say, other than I'm very much yeah. looking forward to our new books. Just one final comment. Uh, the economist Adam Tooze at Columbia University wrote at one point, uh, he wasn't sure if, if one of the problems that we have in the United States is just really accepting another way of life that is not our own, period. And, and of course, China is a country with many characteristics, but it is, not, it is not America. It is not trying to Americanize. It is trying to follow its own road. And in a certain way for a narcissistic personality, it's really hard to accept that there could be more than one way of doing things. And so we'll see if we can finally figure it out. But if we do, I think that we will all have doctor, uh, scholars like Dr. Wong to thank for patiently stimulating dialogue, explaining it to us all, um, making book projects like this happen, um, making it open access so that many millions of people all around the world can get it, not just people who go to top universities. I think mm -hmm. we all owe him a debt of gratitude. And it's, it's actions of him and people like him that have led me to have the confidence to remain in here for the years to come. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob, really. Uh, firstly, I mean, I think we all would like to congratulate you. Uh, very positive and, uh, you know, uh, warm, very touching news that uh, of the personal, you know, development in your life. And indeed, I mean, like people like yourselves as an American living in China and vice versa, many Chinese living in the US, Dr. Wang and Dr. Mabel also traveling so much to Western countries, including the US. There are so many millions and millions of people that continue to be puzzled and that continue to want this relationship to work, to understand, you know, what is it that can take us closer uh, to um, bridging those uh, misunderstanding, those gaps, and also um, how how can we conceive a future that is less narcissistic on either side, uh, that is not only obviously inclusive of the Chinese and American perspective, but like you mentioned, there is a global south. And the fact that these books are open access make uh, the ideas, uh, the concepts uh, accessible to 
another part of the world which is important. So thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Zodin, Dr. Blair, and Jacob Dreyer. And now let's let's invite uh, Kerry Brown, Professor of Chinese Studies and Director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London, for his remarks. Uh, he is also one of the uh, contributors, in essence, to the book. Um, he is someone who has also, in his capacity as a professor, helped bridge uh, the gap of understanding and help people uh, in the West understand China in a more objective way. So now let's understand his perspective on the book, its impact, and uh, how we can further the conversation that's uh, required today. Thank you. Hello. It's a great honor to be able to speak on this conference virtually on the important issue of China's dialogue with the rest of the world. The Center for China and Globalization has been an important partner and under the directorship of Dr. Wang Guiyao, it has been a wonderful opportunity in the last few years to have good collaboration with colleagues in China at a time when there have been many very profound and difficult issues that have beset geopolitics. The book which is being published now is a series of dialogues between Dr. Wang and various figures, and it's an honor for me to be one of them and to be part of this important book. One of the things that I've been thinking about a great deal as 2022 has proceeded is the issue of what will happen in the world should China's economy overtake that of the United States in gross terms. Of course, there can be debate about whether at that moment will ever really happen. There are always very big issues about whether economic growth continues in places as expected. Some have already argued that in fact, in terms of purchasing parity, China has already overtaken the United States. However, in gross terms, of course, the economies are still dissimilar. And I believe now that China's economy is something over two thirds the size of the American economy. And then according to growth rates, there may be a time in the next five or 10 years when it actually overtakes the United States. Regardless of whether that happens, what I have been most interested in in the last few months is just the prospect of it happening and its impact in the outside world, in particular Europe and America. It seems to me that we are in those places ill-prepared for a world in which number one slot may well go to a non-North European or American power. There has been this assumption that enlightenment powers with the political systems they have are the ones that necessarily have to be dominant. But that is an assumption. You can have a huge economy, even though your political system may be very, very different to others. And that's something that China is proving. Mm. Therefore, it doesn't mean that because of the size of your economy, you can make any judgments about, for instance, which political system is preferable for economic growth whether you have to do certain things in order to have a large economy. The debate about China may be one day becoming number one. Certainly in America and more and more in Europe <coughs> has been clouded by this idea that somehow economic force is linked to military force or other kinds of force. Mm. It's also about the assumption that China will be in some ways like an emulator or copier of the United States with its desire often to intervene and to have an almost universal scope to its power. I don't think too that that can be necessarily proved. For sure, it seems to me China has strong interests and you can define those and they're defined every day by its leaders and analysts and others. But whether you can really say that China wants to emulate the United States and be a power like that, that seems to me to be a step too far. At very best, we can say we don't know at the moment. I think it's very likely from the evidence over the last 30 years that China will be a power which is different to the United States. That difference is the thing that I think unsettles people. It's this issue of China not performing to a certain paradigm. The work of the philosopher in the 1960s, Thomas Kuhn, was about famously paradigm shifts and about how enormous investment is made in one particular framework and that as it is undercut, disproved, falsified, there is more and more of a kind of inability for many people most invested in the former paradigm 
to see some kind of transition and the creation of a new paradigm. New paradigms happen all the time. And in many ways, perhaps the most important in global world politics has been that created by China, simply because it has become, with a very different and distinctive political system, the world's second largest economy, and as I said, possibly the world's largest in the next 10 years. The response of much of the Western world, and by Western I mean here Northern European, principally in North American, has been often to be panicky, to be uncertain and to really reflect its issues with China back on itself and show, I think, a lack of confidence, which surprises me. It seemed to me only 15 years ago before the great economic crisis in 2008, that the West had a great deal more confidence that its models were very viable and attractive in terms of politics and economic growth and that they had to necessarily go with each other Indeed, in his famous work of Francis Fukuyama, a couple of decades before that, in the early 1990s, in the end of history in The Last Man, argued that it was really about the feelings that people had in democracies, which made it different. They felt happier, more contented, more prosperous. Democracy made you happier. Well, I don't think we could be so simplistic today. I'm not saying that democracy doesn't make some people happy. And I'm not saying its alternative doesn't also make some people unhappy, but I don't think that we can make great categorizations. There is no necessary link between your political system and whether you citizens feel happy or not. It may be that the most we can offer is that people across all political systems as of today, the end of 2022, feel very dissatisfied and unhappy it's possible, however, that we have to look at something more complicated and say that there are particular groups in particular places, no matter what political system they're in, that have very variable feelings and that therefore a simplistic model that tries to impose across all terrains, regardless of culture, social structure, economic growth, is no longer fit for purpose. We have reached a paradigm shift. The Enlightenment philosopher David Hume wrote famously that despite the fact that until today, for instance, certain things happened and certain things followed, there mm -hmm. was a possibility that one day in the future, in fact, A would not cause B. That, for instance, the sun would not come up in the morning or that when you put your hand in water, it wouldn't feel wet. Now, of course, uh, this is, in terms of probability, uh, beyond the calculable. Uh, causation on the whole can reach such a level that you can be beyond certain that things will happen. But it seems to me that in social sciences, it's become much more precarious to make any bold predictions about what kind of models might have real absolute validity. And that David Hume's scepticism is therefore more than ever justified. It is right probably for you to be very sceptical about whether one political model is really going to be universalizable. Although it may well be that all political models do need to undertake reform and revision. It seems to me, therefore, it's important today in this dialogue for us to stress a sense of humility. It seems to me important in dialogue to be open-ended, skeptical, but also able to encounter strong ideas, arguments, and evidence from others, and to be able to change one's own viewpoint. Flexibility, I think, is really important, particularly as, on the whole, in much of social media and other forms of platforms, the rewards go to those who sound the most convinced, but have the least basis on which to base their convictions. The rise of China and the fact that it has been a challenge for Americans and others is something to me that offers us an opportunity for learning and self-reflection. It is not so much that I am particularly welcoming or hostile to a dramatic change like the one that is likely we're going to see in the next decade. A world where China one world where China is number one to me at least is a world which doesn't look massively different from the world today. 
And it probably is a world in which there are more opportunities for thinking about things in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. But I am very, very aware of, as I say, the high sense of anxiety and concern and the ways yeah. in which this transfers itself, for instance, into issues about China's influence, military influence, and claims about the desire of China to have influence and impact on others. And there, I find that my skepticism grows stronger. We have all learned during the pandemic that our systems are in need of radical direction. We've all learned that we have to cooperate in key areas, whether pandemics, climate change, nuclear proliferation, or sustainable growth. Because if we don't cooperate, we won't achieve anything, and we certainly won't solve the long term problems. A new form of globalization, I think, will be happening. And that may well have China's role much more enhanced because it will be the biggest economy. Even though in per capita terms, it's still going to obviously be smaller than much smaller than America and others. That to me is a world which is one that is perfectly bearable and livable in. And it's good for dialogues like this to show that it's perfectly possible to have reasoned civil discussion and debate and learning from each other inside and outside China. And that's the important mission that the organization and Dr. Wang and his colleagues support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was Professor Kerry Brown. And uh, really, I mean, the significance of the paradigm shift, which he talked about, um, how it's important uh, to question our positions as such, um, accept the changes that are apparent, that are real. And also, I think um, an idea from, from his remarks uh, for me is that the effectiveness with which either China or the US is able to engage developing countries, a majority part of the world, is also going to be uh, going to serve as a core determining factor um, to really understand that um, one system, one way of thinking has not worked for a majority of the world's people and how China's dynamism, China's success, um, is indeed playing a role in helping questions, uh, question preconceived notions. So with that, um, we conclude our panel discussion. Let's invite Dr. Wang Huiyao for concluding remarks, for any mm -hmm. comments on, sure. the, okay. on, the, uh, on the interventions. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you. Thank you, Zoom. And uh, uh, really, again, I think we are, we are getting to the end of uh, mm -hmm. our time. I, I really uh, want to uh, appreciate very much uh, the uh, the contribute of, of this dialogue uh, that I have been able very uh, honorary uh, and uh, and uh, uh, fortunate to have time to uh, to do dialogue with them in such a difficult and challenging time and we we've been so far apart and uh, there is so much going on in the last several years you know the the, the globalization and the pandemic and and also trade the frictions and and also geopolitical. Uh, things and of course Ukraine war and all those things. So, so I think you know it's really uh, that uh, I'm very grateful uh, to those, those great thinkers and uh, you know people from different uh, background, but uh, uh, you know experience and in their uh, own right are very uh, you know uh, global uh, opinion leaders to to have a dialogue with them. I think you know we have been really also fortunate today to hear so many uh, panelists, very distinguished panelists to to share their views uh, on how we can really help in those uh, uh, dialogues and helping this really uh, promote the mutual understanding. And also, of course, uh, to, to while we are in such a deep uh, uh, geo geopolitical divide and also, of course, pandemic divide, uh, still, I mean, there is hope. There is, <laughs> there is a momentum. There is, a, there is a also... Uh, uh, you know, goodwill to to continue these uh, these exchanges and communications and dialogue and bridge building. I think CCG and myself we are really regard ourselves as a bridge builder. So we hope that uh, you know this is just as beginning. And uh, uh, myself, my and my team, and and all my CCG colleagues, of course, all are very much share this uh, uh, mission that we want to promote globalization more inclusive, more. Mm -hmm. Uh, balanced and of course more healthy and of course together we we want to work with you know our, our friends around the world and work people in the United States European countries African Latin American you know uh, and you know Asian ASEAN we, you name it we want to you know really a truly global uh, think tank that wants to dialogue with other people 
in this world. And uh, once again, I, I want to thank all of you very much uh, for, for participating in our dialogues, particularly as a contributor of our dialogues, but also uh, uh, to this afternoon with such a distinguished panelist to share their uh, very uh, kind and, and very uh, generous views on our book. But also I want to thank the publisher again, you know, for their vision, for their strong support. And, uh, you know, we're, which is a very famous publisher, a renowned publisher worldwide, uh, to really work with TCCG. And also uh, I, I want to thank, you know, uh, all the uh, uh, people in this world that uh, still has a strong hope for globalization to work and for uh, a very better, uh, you know, brighter future of tomorrow. So once again, thank all of you and uh, appreciate so much your time to participate. And thank Zoom for thank you. <laughs> organizing this, uh, you know, modern this, uh, panel. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. I think with that, obviously, uh, the dialogue will continue, the conversation will continue, but we will conclude today's event. Uh, thank you. Once again, uh, publisher William McCower, also Lawrence Brown, Professor Kerry Brown, uh, Dr. David Blair, Harvey Zodin, and uh, Jacob Dreyer, also Dr. Mabel Lu Miao. And thank you for watching. Thank you for uh, being part of this journey with us at CCG. Like Dr. Wang mentioned, this is our consistent mission. This is our value to bridge gaps, to deepen understanding, and for really to pursue truly global values. So do download the book. The link is right there. Uh, you can download, you can read, and do share your feedback and continue to follow Center for China and Globalization's activities. Thank you for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.